May, well, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, welcome to the Board of Education meeting for tonight. We have a lot of exciting things going on and get to recognize some, uh, some of our excellent teachers and there's some promotions and there's uh, 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 someone leaving us. And so I guess we'll get started. The first thing we always do is roll call. Colburn? Here. Coleman? Edie? Here. Quieter? Here. Eggmeister? Here. Lewison? Here. Herman? Here. We have quorum. Okay, next I will, Dave. Mr. President, uh, I move to add item 9.1, general obligation bond finance sale and disclosure to our agenda to add 13.2, executive session acquisition of real property and move, remove item 8.5, bond projects from business to spoken reports uh, and approve the amended agenda. Second by Leah. All those in favor? Motion passes 6 0. Okay, please join us for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. So one of the first things, best things we always love to do is uh, recognize our staff or students and or uh, and tonight we're uh, honoring some teachers uh, for the reading roadmap um, recognition and you know as well you know teachers are essential to uh, helping children learn to read um, uh, to their fullest capacity and we do have the best teachers in the in the nation and it's our pleasure to honor those teachers tonight congratulations to our outstanding early literacy teachers award winners from frank bergman deborah shepaw northview is Andrea Wallenberg, Ogden is Marcia Schreiner, Theodore Roosevelt is Marilyn George, Lee Elementary is Karen Buell, and Bluemont is Kim Iverson. You gotta stay up there, come on. <laughs> the Kansas Reading Roadmap Outstanding Early Literacy Teacher Award recognizes a teacher who contributes significantly to early literacy at their school. KRR asks schools to nominate a teacher who has played a critical role in the school to help students succeed in reading. The nominees were honored by KRR within their respective schools during National Teacher Appreciation Week. The nominees will be considered for, by KRR for the statewide Outstanding Early Literacy Teacher of the Year honor to be awarded at the organization's state conference in August. Since 2013, KRR has worked with elementary schools and boys and girls clubs across the state aligning after school, summer, and family engagement programs with school data. KRR seeks to ensure all students read at grade level upon entering the fourth grade. KRR is a partnership between local schools, the Kansas Technical Assistance System Network, and the Kansas Department for Children and Families. Congratulations again to Deborah, Andrea, Marsha, Marilyn, Karen, and Kim. Thank you for teaching in Manhattan, Ogden. We're proud of you. Not yet. Because out of the 58 that are nominated, you can just select one person. It'll be announced in August. Okay, now we, I guess I'll, in our consent agenda tonight, we have the uh, minutes from the May 15th meeting. It's been three weeks since we've had a meeting. Uh, consideration of bills, the HR report, there's an addendum um, in our uh, EBN. Uh, one, I wanna note that uh, we are uh, losing Lacey Sell. She will be going to, uh, I, I don't know for sure the, uh, the title, but she'll be going to Junction City as, uh, as uh, Associate Superintendent. What did I skip? Oh, okay. I will. I will backtrack to that when I'm done here. So. 
Um, and we have our HR report, we have donations and grants, um, school meal prices, uh, board policy graduation requirement, uh, district wellness plan, and the National Conservation Foundation Envirothon in North Carolina. And we always like to highlight our donations and there's a bunch of them this time. So I will read through those. Um, we have $2,300 of football cleats from Dick's Sporting Goods to Eisenhower for the football program. Uh, 1969 cash donation to Northview Elementary PTA to Northview Elementary for a field trip transportation. $1,000 donation from Manhattan Ogden Public School Foundation Kevin Coffey BPA account to the Manhattan High School for Business Professional America Travel Expenses. A $4,200 donation from Riley County Raising Riley um, to Eugene Field Early Learning Center for Behavioral and Mental Health support personnel to reimburse for costs associated with extended child care services. $1,000 cash donation from DeHart Plumbing, Heating and Cooling to the USC 33 for the Fit Closet. $2,298 cash donation from Anthony Middle School Booster Club to Anthony Middle School to purchase two water bottle filling stations. $4,256 cash donation from Anthony Middle School Booster Club to Anthony Middle School installation of projector caf projector in the cafeteria. A $1,367 cash donation from Theodore Roosevelt Elementary PTO to Theodore Roosevelt for elementary trips. $1,000 cash donation from Dylan Mack to the Manton High School for equipment and travel for the MHS baseball team. $1,364 cash donation from elementary, Northview Elementary PTA to Northview Elementary for transportation to the Omaha Zoo. $500 cash donation from Manhattan Ogden Public School Foundation to Anthony Middle School for Science Olympiad. $2,500 cash donation from Manhattan Public School Foundation to Manhattan High School for sound, audio, sound studio equipment. $19,000, $749 cash donation from Manhattan High Booster Club to Manhattan High School for purchases made this spring for football, wrestling, boys golf, spring fling, cross country, girls tennis, music department, boys basketball, baseball, athletic training, and the fitness center for a total of $43,505. Those donations are always very helpful to the district, and there's a lot of things we can't do without those, those generous generosity of our, uh, of our community. And I've hit the end of my word limit for the night, so we are done. <laughs> oh, okay. I keep getting these, uh, it's like special new year. See Saturday Night Live and they keep <laughs> handing. Uh, now if you can read it. Yeah. Other um, I also would like to announce that uh, we have uh, named Andrew T.D. as the Executive Director of Special Services. So congratulations, Andrea. <laughs> so we've, we've had a lot of movement within our district lately. We have also Eric Obama, who's now our uh, principal at Lee School. And, and uh, I think it's, I, I love our, having our homegrown talent stay right, you know, come right here in town and, and uh, promote them from within. And um, it's, although it's kind of, there's a domino effect because when one, some, somebody gets promoted, then we have to hire someone else. But, but I think that's a good problem to have, so, especially at that, at that level. So good luck to you both. I miss you both. All right. So were you ready to approve the consent yes. agenda? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I move to approve Anybody the consent agenda. Anybody got any more agenda. notes for me to <laughs> announce? Okay. Let's see. Yes, Daryl. Oh, okay. Motion by Dave, seconded by Daryl. All those in favor? Motion passes 6 0. Okay, at this point now, we, we uh, have uh, recognition of visitors and citizen comments. This is the point in the meeting where we uh, anybody that wants to speak to the board about anything that is not on the agenda um, can speak to the board and you have three minutes to speak and you would be timed by our board clerk. So anybody wishing to speak to the board at this time? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. So our first report for the night would be for, uh, from Trish, I guess, for a uh, construction update. Okay, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Right. Let's see, got a lot going on. Um, 
Eugene Field and College Hill, we brought to you, um, we presented those to you as the board. We also took them to facilities and growth, um, got the thumbs up from them. Um, so we're in schematic design, we're gonna progress to design development. Um, so I'm gonna ask that I get a thumbs up from you to go from one phase to the other, um, unless you guys have any comments or changes that you saw to the um, designs of those two facilities. Yes. We good? All right. Okay. That's it. Sorry. I, th I think that's kind of how we'll look at our process going forward is we'll, we'll show it to facilities and growth, bring it to the full board, back to the facilities and growth. So if you do have any comments or any slow down speeds up or big changes you want, give that input in there and we'll plan on kind of that process throughout the facilities and growth board, facilities and growth board. And if there's anything from facilities and growth that they have comments, we'll take them, the designers obviously will take them back and incorporate them into the plans before they present them to the entire board. And then, you know, vice versa. If you guys have anything, then they'll incorporate them back as well. So, and then obviously the process will be the same thing from schematic design to design development, design development then to construction documents as well. So, okay. Um, Blue Township, kind of the same process we did. Um, we showed you guys the plans, went to facilities and growth. So um, we need to progress from that one as well, from design development also to schem um, from schematic design to design development. So does anybody have any um, anything they want to change that didn't like or questions that we can move on, progress forward to design development? Thumbs? Yes, Carla. Yeah. This is not specific to the design development and so forth, but because there are a couple of us on the board who weren't here for the last go round, yeah. and there's a full group in the room tonight, and hopefully a few people watching on Facebook, okay. can you just help give us a foundational educational piece? What schematic? When we talk, because you guys talk oh, very familiarly, yeah, <laughs> what is schematic sorry. design? What is design development? And what is yeah. The last thing yep. you said, construction, construction or something. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Just, just put it in terms that, that that way we're all kind of on the same page and the public sure. gets the same thing. Thanks. Sure. Um, schematic design is uh, when they first start out with getting the information, kind of gathering the information from the design group, and we kind of start frameworking how is the either addition or the building, what is it, what is it going to look like, what, what are the components that need to go into um, the addition or the building. And so they start framing out the shape of the building basically. Um, and when you go from the schematic design and then into design, and they have actually put in some rooms and they've kind of, here's, you know, where the offices are gonna be, sped, whatever. But the details aren't there, like bathrooms, where's the toilet actually gonna be, the sinks, where's the cabinets gonna be, you know, um, that type of thing. So you gotta progress from the schematic designs, then you gotta get into the design development. And that's when they really start getting to the, it, what I call the nitty gritty. Um, that's when you start doing elevations, you start doing cut throughs to the buildings, um, you do wall sections, you do the foundations, you start really getting into the site development and those type of things. And that's the design development. And then from design development, you get into the construction documents and that's where they really have to really start re, uh, defining more of the um, details of the project that the bidder can go and actually bid out you know, all the materials, how much is he going to need concrete, how much is he going to need steel um, from that. So they have to, a typical set is about 200 sheets, 200 to 300 sheets on a big building. Um, that's those the construction documents that they can actually hand out to a steel worker or the concrete or whoever, and that's how they bid them out. But it's just those details that are very fine in the construction, but we just have to progress from one phase to the next to the next. Uh-huh. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, Amanda Arnold, I put a sheet in front of you. This had not been presented to you, but it's kind of a fast paced little project. There's not a whole lot happening in Amanda Arnold. Um, you'll notice that the um, parking lot addition is going to be the to the southwest um, part of the property, but it's an extension of what the parking they already have. It's gonna be an addition of about 32 parking spaces to what they currently already have. Um, we're also going to try to address the um, drainage issue that they have on that south side that's really bad. If you guys have ever been out there after a lot of rain, there's a bunch of water that just pools on the south side of the property kind of after the bridge that you walk over. So we're going to try to address that. There's a detail at the bottom that shows a concrete ditch. It's a concrete ditch lining that we're hoping that once the water comes off of 
off the street and kind of through that drainage tube underneath the street. It'll collect in that drainage ditch and then it'll keep on going down to the south of the property and just keep on going past. Um, so the alternate, this is, so the base bid is going to be the parking lot and the drainage ditch. We will have a couple alternates. We're going to have an alternate to do some ADA parking um, on the southern part because Kathy would like to have an a true ADA entry into the multi-purpose cafeteria room and some ADA parking has to be then located on that south side. Another alternate would be to put a trash enclosure around the trash uh, dumpsters because right now kind of trash goes everywhere if it's overflowing. And then another alternate would be to replace um, the parking lot lights um, to make them brighter or add a few parking lot lights here and there. So those will be three alternates that we will do as well to this project. I would also like to note that BHS is going to bid this project two different directions. We're going to bid it as a schedule for the work to be done this summer, but we're also going to bid it as a schedule to be the work to be done next summer. We want to see, because we're so late in the process and bidding it out in June, mid-June to late June, we want to make sure that we're going to get the best for our construction dollars. So if it makes more feasible sense to get the work done next summer, then that's what we need to do so that we're not overpaying just to get work done this summer. So we're gonna bid it out two directions. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Otherwise we'd like to move forward and get this out to bid this month. Dave. So again, in terms of for some people that are new to this process, could you just briefly explain the, what goes on with alternates? What? Alternate. So um, in a base bid, like I said, in a base bid with the parking lot and the drainage, that's a base bid. Is, this is what your true, this is the base bid. That's what we would accept. An alternate would be, like I said, the ADA parking or the trash enclosure. If we have enough money within the budget, we can accept all the alternates, one of the alternates, two of the alternates, however we could fit into the budget if we see fit. We can prioritize with the budget or with the alternates. We just, um, that's kind of how we do alternates too. We can add value um, or we may have to take out something if we can't afford to build something. So we build, we can build in add alternates or deduct alternates when we go into bidding projects. And these would be all add alternates um, for this project. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thanks. Any other questions on Amanda Arnold? Okay. If, if so, we'd like that to proceed our, forward. Yeah, and our team was optimistic that we would be able to get favorable pricing that would meet within budget this year. It'd be nice to move ground if that's totally possible. But like I said, we, our talk was we don't want to overpay to make that happen. So we're looking at, we're hedging our bets on both sides. Right. Okay. So then we have had, um, <clears throat> we've been talking with the middle schools. Um, I met today actually with the a group of teachers to hear what they had to say about the plans on that as well. Um, we will be taking the middle school plans to facilities and growth next week to see, get an overview on that. And then the last meeting in June, we'll bring the uh, middle school projects to you guys as well to look at. Um, right now, the additions look as if they're part of what is now the seventh and eighth graded um, wings. And we'll make the same thing as the next wing as well, but we'll have a, obviously a storm shelter as well. So those talks are going really well. Um, we will be flipping the media center and the administration area in those. Um, we've had more, we had another meeting at the West campus, um, kind of a gen, again, another general overview um, of how many classrooms, what do we want those additions to look like. Um, Gould Evans did bring us five <clears throat> different options for additions and the last two that they showed us were favorable and I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag on what it was, but I think you guys would be happy. <laughs> so we're trying to maximize, again, the additions that they would propose to us to get the most classrooms that we can possibly get um, for that site since we know it is the last edition. And we are continuing talks with um, Gould Evans and McCown Gordon on the Keith Knoll Center. Um, we are anticipating and looking to try and possibly still bid out an early bid package on the metal building to try and get that since it takes the longest. Um, and now some other general notes. Um, we are doing an internal bid or internal budget adjustment between College Hill and Eugene Field, just so you know. Um, <clears throat> early on when they changed that we wanted to equalize the number of classrooms between the two projects, 
the budgets weren't aligned to make that. So we are going to make some just internal budget adjustments, but the construction dollar amounts between the two are going to, they will equal out and still there's a zero between the two of them. So it just going to shift some monies internally to make sure that we stay. So just wanted to let you guys know that to kind of keep it up front. And so there's no surprises. So do you guys have any questions? No. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the thumbs up. Um, <clears throat> before we go on, I, I apologize. I didn't say anything earlier, but uh, I also want to recognize that we had a Boys and Girls Club representation here, and they're a partner with us um, with the the uh, Reading Roadmap, because um, that's not just during a school day. That's uh, before and after school program. Um, so if you're here with the, with the uh, Boys and Girls Club, would you please stand so we can just... <laughs> Okay, Dr. Wade. Thank you, Trent, for being here. Appreciate it. And that nice segue that, that Trish was talking earlier about how lots of things going on and, you know, we just continue with, with all the things going on in the district that we've got the summer feeding program. i uh, got Boys and Girls Club in the schools. We've got the summer STEM going on. Uh, Ogden's got its its free summer school program. Uh, Blast at Bergman, on and on. I mean, just everybody's busy continuing the, the teaching and learning that right on through the summer. And, and of course, Matt and his crew working around all of that to get the things done for facilities for next school year. So it's, you know, it, a lot of activity in the district. Uh, also want to touch on something that, that President Herman mentioned earlier about uh, we do have administrators moving up and on and into other districts. We've got internal advancement within our district that we've, we've got quite a bit of movement this summer. And I don't think we've really had an opportunity in the past to discuss here the process for filling administrative vacancies. So President Herman mentioned it might be a good, good time to just uh, walk through that. So Andy's, Andy's coming up to help me with this a little bit if, if I need it, but Kind of the, the, the basic process we have is the same with every administrative vacancy that we have. We get the resignation from the individual that's leaving the district. We pull up the job description, review, revise it if we need to for that position. And then Andy gets a vacancy notice posted. And we have this information available on our website. We've got a, a closing date. We've got the, the process for applying. And people that go on our website will see that we've got an applicant portal that we use. And some of, some of you in the audience have been through this before. And people apply uh, by the closing date and they submit their documents to that portal for us to review. And at the same time, Andy Turner, the Director of Human Resources, is working on getting the committee process together identifying people to be on the interview committee, uh, district administrators, building administrator, staff of the building, if it's a building that we've got a vacancy for, getting those individuals um, lined up for the interview, making sure that we can have, find dates that will work for everybody to be here for any of the steps that we, we need to, <coughs> to have in order to, to fill the vacancy. Uh, then we look at, when will we have the interviews? We, after we get the closing date arrives, we go through uh, pre-select candidates to come in and interview based on criteria we look at. Uh, if it's, a, an, in fact, we talked about this a little bit today, if it's an elementary vacancy, do they have elementary teaching experience? Do they have administrative experience? If they do have administrative experience, is it at the elementary level? What size school, what kind of demographics, the, looking for the fit there with those candidates and then pre-select who to bring in to the interview committee. Then we get our questions together and jump in anytime because I, you know, we pull in, pull in our questions, uh, schedule the interviews and announce, you know, these are the individuals coming in and interviewing. We bring them in and have set questions for all of the candidates. So we go through the same process with each candidate. These, these are the questions, they're confidential questions. We go through it with them. The people, everybody on the committee 
rates that candidate. And then the HR department takes those ratings and it's a rating scale of one to five. And Dr. Wade, uh, I provided the process oh, good. Okay. Uh, to each one of the members. The, uh, the first page that you have uh, covers all the procedures that we go through. The second page that you have uh, outlines the process and it gives you an idea of what is in a, for that specific one, an elementary uh, principal interview committee. Uh, finally, uh, on the last page, uh, it's just a, a little bit of a data chart, and that's what the uh, interview committee receives after we, we have all the data that's input uh, into our system based on uh, how the interviewees rated on each one of the respective questions. We compile all that and we provide that to the committee members. And then the committee members meet, have a discussion, and make a recommendation to the superintendent. Sir. And then I take those recommendations. We, we I get the input from the interview committee, but we also get the comments from the meet and greet that people give us input there and bring that in consideration. So we look at the, the, the ratings from the actual interview questions, but that's not the sole determinant because there's other factors that come into play. So we look at the comments from the, the meet and greet. We have whatever discussions necessary that the, com the committee provides me with their recommendations anonymously that I might as well, I, what I do is I pass out a piece of paper with the names of the candidates. And it, it's, it's, one or, it's one of a couple different variations. It's circle the one behind the name of the individual who's your first choice, a two on the individual that's your second. Uh, put an X through the name of somebody if you cannot support them for this position. And people fold that over, don't sign it, pass it to somebody on the committee who adds those up and then reports out to the committee. This is, this is how our votes went. Then from there, I facilitate a discussion about here, here's what we've got, here's the input, here's the discussion, let's talk about this. And in some cases, we need to have another vote that maybe there's three candidates, one gets ruled out and we vote again between the two that were the highest vote getters. Sometimes it ends up being one individual is the clear cut candidate from the committee. And we, we discuss those things. Uh, I end up speaking with, Mr. Turner speaks with any external candidates that are not, high, that are not gonna be recommended by me. I speak to the internal candidates from the district and the individual that I would wanna recommend to the board. So I recommend to the board and I accept sole responsibility for that, but it's with input from other individuals, from anybody that gives comments at the meet and greet, from anybody on the interview committee uh, giving me the anonymous feedback. And, they, and they're, they're welcome to share their comments as well, but I also want them to be able to, to vote without anybody knowing who voted for who. And then we're, we're sworn to confidentiality and bring it to the board. There's probably something I'm missing there, but I'll look over at you guys. Eric's always involved in it as well. Clearly outlined the procedures. Uh, I mean, I, uh, a one pager for you if you have any questions on it. More than happy to discuss. Any, any questions? Dave? Not a question, just thanks for the detail and the specificity. Uh, it's a big process. and. It's an important process, and I appreciate how, how thorough you are in pursuing it. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you for. I'd probably say the only thing, and and we're checking candidates along the process. Um, yeah, good. Probably a pretty superficial check at the beginning, checking on a few things. But the further you get down the line, the deeper and deeper we'll check. And when we get down to a final recommended candidate, we'll be pretty in depth with the questions we ask and how we go forward on recommendations or people we know that have worked in those areas before too. So that, that's part of the process too, is finding input from people outside, but we just dig a little deeper. There's no need to dig if they're not even going to screen out. So. And in the screen out piece, I, the three of us do the screening, but we do it independently that we each take all of the all of the information from the candidate from the applicants and 
look at them independently, and then we get together to see how close. And I'm, I'm pleased with how close we end up being on which candidates to bring bring forward to the committee to interview. And one re and one reason we do that is because my experience in the past has been, if we bring in the entire interview committee, and we bring in 14 different or 17 different. Uh, files and let them go through it and take the time to figure out which ones to interview based on what we've identified as desirable attributes. Invariably, there's certain things that that they get ruled out anyway. If they don't have experience, the example I gave earlier, if they don't have elementary experience of any kind, they're probably not going to get interviewed, not in our district, not for an elementary principal position. Uh, if there's gaps in their their experience if there there's just things we look for that other that the committee members if they were all in the room with this if there's a dozen of them or 15 of them they would rule those same people out that we we are ruling out and we explained to them like today explained why the more people didn't come to the committee to be interviewed that we pre-screen them based on these criteria yeah, and, and usually there's a natural break where we we don't necessarily say four candidates because sometimes we've had three sometimes we've had five for some of those positions but when kind of you get to the screen outs and you get down to three four four, there's usually a natural break where there's a gap and if the gap comes between five and six you take five if the gap if there's a clear gap between three and four you take three carla do you guys for the for that initial um review do you use a rubric do you just do you use a tool in order to do that or does it just come through your in the initial we uh, we identify the event? screen we identify we, we have a sit down uh, a lot of times dr wade does it or identify the screening criteria and what they're looking for and you know if it's an elementary principle you're typically uh, the screening criteria has been uh, s solid administrative experience at that level and solid teaching experience at that level. If they've had that, they're, they're, they're usually a primary uh, candidate for. So those, those the criterion is established beforehand and we look at that and we make ratings based on a, a one through five, if you will, on where they fell in with that, that respective criterion. But it's also not so rigid that, uh, yeah, let's, say, let's say a teacher with all kinds of experience doesn't necessarily just get ruled out because they haven't been a principal. But in most cases, the positions we have, we do have uh, experienced principals applying for those positions. That makes it more difficult for someone without administrative experience to get in the, the interview, interview pool. But it does, we don't just necessarily rule them out because of that. Anyone else? Thank you for your hard work on that, both of you. And and uh, I asked for that a couple of days ago, so yeah. thanks for putting it together. Well, but thanks for the opportunity. It, it's important, I think, to be transparent, and so the committee knows how we're doing. And since we've had a lot of uh, changes this year, I thought it was important yeah. to let the community know how we do it. So, yeah. there you go. Thank and you. that concludes my report. Unless there's a, a question for me about something. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. All right. Do we have? NEA, I think uh, Aaron's in this DC or something, right? Okay. I mean, I shouldn't have said, yeah. I mean, there's somebody at her house, though, at home. <laughs> a giant dog, yeah. Okay, but Board of Education, Daryl? Nothing really, except uh, it's time to get ready for elections again. Uh, sorry to see two names go off. It's been a great board and a great group to work with, so. Hopefully we'll continue on with the new group. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Done. He saved it for me. Daryl and I will be entertaining each other and anybody else in the community who wants to join us for a coffee on Saturday morning. It is the second Saturday of June and it is our turn. So we are going to be hanging out at the Panera on the east side of town. Um, so I think that's technically East Points. Yes. Um, 
at nine o'clock Saturday morning. And we would be happy to have a conversation with anybody who wants to come and hang out with us for a little bit. Um, I think that's all I have. I have questions for things throughout the meeting, so I'll save anything else till then. I don't have anything, so I was hoping in lieu of my comments, I could ask Michelle to quickly come up and talk about, uh, I think she was involved in the Emergency Operations Center recently with the flood. Um, as many people know, we have a pretty good partnership with our local jurisdictions, and they kind of render mutual aid to each other. And I know Michelle was uh, doing some work recently uh, with the flood information. Yeah, it was busy last week, all of a sudden. Um, I started getting emails um, late in the week, the week before last week, um, that they were, um, the, the Emergency Operations Center, the EOC was going to start up, uh, had started to have daily meetings, watching the levels of the lake and the rivers. Um, and then on Memorial Day, I got called in to go to the fire department, um, sit in the EOC, really get caught up with what was going on because it was really starting to ramp up then. And um, from there, um, it almost turned, like the next day it turned into a 24-hour operation. And so remember last time I told you that we had started that Flint Hills PIO group? We were visionaries. <laughs> Luckily, we had started that because uh, this team um, had to man the PIO desk, Public Information Office desk, 24 hours a day for about three days. And so you're already starting with a small group, and then you just get stretched for 24 hours. Um, but what a joy to work with these people. Um, we had uh, hospital, K-State, uh, police department, city, um, forgetting other people, county people. Um, it, it truly was a, a great, great group to work with. We were um, tasked with putting out information. So all of the Facebook, the Twitter, website, uh, interviews, press conferences, we did all of that. And so um, we learned a lot about um, what needs we would ever need again to pull something like that off because I don't have access to city stuff. They don't have access to mine. How do, how, you know, how do we communicate among ourselves? Where do we put all of our stuff so everybody can access it? Um, so we learned a, learned a lot. Um, I just got some stats today from Vivian at the city. Our top post about the flood reached 137 pe 137,000 people. Um, we had uh, over half a million total impressions on Twitter, mm -hmm. and the city of website, the city of Manhattan website, saw over 200,000 visitors just about you know within 10 days or so. Um, and then we had about 400 phone calls come in on the hotline, so um, it was. Pretty impressive to see how everything worked all together, being a part of the emergency operations and then um, the big FEMA plan. Um, you, you take the classes and you learn about it, and it's very boring to learn about it, but when you're in it, um, it's very interesting. And I learned more than I would ever want to know about waterways <laughs> and how things are all connected and why we had to stop water, why others let water out, and it is so much more complicated than people realize. Um, but there are good people who watch those things, who um, that's their job, and they are very good at it. Um, so um, again, we are lucky to live in this community because we all partner, we all get along. And that's what our PIO group said is, um, this time it was this event, but next time it'll be something else. And aren't we blessed to be able to have this group to communicate with and um, know that they'll come and help if we ever need them. Anything else? I, just, I had a meeting Monday with Matt and Parks and Rec. They got to help out with that. Mm -hmm. And they said they have never seen it so well organized and put together and everybody cooperates so well, ever. 
they thought it was tremendous. And I know that has a lot to do with the work you've been doing and the work that, that the police department, fire stations have all been doing over the last several years in preparedness for disasters. So I just wanted to, they were very impressed. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I am very excited that it's election season again and that <laughs> you're not running. <laughs> and that I'm not running. Yeah, yeah. Not it. Um, but I'm excited that we have folks that are willing to step up and run. And we saw that uh, across the community in um, school board and in city commission. So it's very, very exciting. So, um, and I just wanted to say thank you um, to you two board members who uh, have served and have served well and are gonna, I'm sure, serve out the rest of your term um, in, a, in a great manner. So thank you very much. It's a bit of a struggle to know what to say now. I've still got six months <laughs> to go here, which is interesting since this would have been like the next to the last meeting, but now we get to go for another six months. Um, I'll, I'll take the opportunity tonight. So, you know, over 16 years, I've seen a lot of people have been asking me what was, what's the best, what's the worst, what are you proud of? Um, one of my earliest memories I'm saying Deb Shapa is here in, in the room, and one of my earliest memories is going to a, I don't even remember what building it was in, but went, I think it was at Bergman, um, went to learn about some things, and it was, I think it was a KASB event, maybe. But anyway, the, the, the language teachers, the early learning teachers were talking about things, and I remember so clearly Deborah Shapa talking about dibbles. And that, that word just sort of struck me and it stuck in my head. I'm like, what is that? And, and now he's our um, IT director. And it's like, um, you know, I've got a, I've got a lot to learn here. There's, and it, you know, that was, so it was, so Deb's been at this a long time. I appreciate her dedication. And lately she's been uh, the, one of the consultants on designing the new elementary school. And she's brought a lot of insight because um, we've looked at Bergman as, you know, as our newest elementary school, and there's a lot of things we like about it, but it's not perfect. And so she's been one of the ones that, that's brought up the points of, well, this doesn't necessarily work great at Bergman. Can we tweak this? So, um, but I, that memory of hearing the word dibbles will just stick with me <laughs> to the grave. Like, what the heck is that? Um, and, you know, Greg's not going to be sitting here for a long time, so I'll you know, the times that I've gotten to work with Greg at Eisenhower and then at Manhattan, I um, deeply treasured times. Um, and that, so that brings up the, the, you know, people ask me, why do I do this job? And the answer is the people that are sitting in this room. Um, it's just amazing to get to work with educators. Um, they're so passionate about what they do and so dedicated to helping kids um, and, you know, one of the little mantras my grandfather used to say is uh, to be a good person, surround yourself with good people. And there's no better way than to, to surround yourself with good people other than to get involved in public schools. Um, so it's been an honor and a privilege. And um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss it, but I've got some time to, to process and, and talk some more. So... Uh, Thanks, Leah, for serving with me. I kind of twisted Leah's arm to get onto the board <laughs> at a football game, as I recall. Uh, uh, so, look forward to the to the transitional process. I look forward to talking to the the candidates that are running and, and seeing how this all unfolds. And I think that's all I've got. Well said, Dave. <clears throat> well, it's uh, been three weeks since our last meeting and uh, we did have our graduation that we went through. Uh, that went off very well. I know thanks to the staff and everybody for uh, um, all their hard work on that. I know K-State puts in a lot of, uh, lot of work and I, that's a very good partnership that we have with them. Um, <clears throat> I'm also happy to see that we have five candidates now. I've always, I always say that 
that uh, the citizens deserve a choice. So I'm glad there's more than just uh, four of us. Um, so we have Joe, I, didn't, I don't recall the last name, but Diesenbrock. And then of course we had Kristen Brighton was the first one to file. And, and I don't remember the fifth person, Brandy Santos. So, but we got six months. So hopefully, you know, we'll have, uh, I bet, you know, probably, probably in the, in the fall, we'll probably start off with the, uh, the public forums. And the uh, first time I ran for the board is, with with Dave, there were seven people that ran for the four spots, and we had eleven public forums okay. in like two months, and it was just it, it was very it was very hard work to get on the board. So it's yeah, but it but like I said, it, it's worth the time, and and but I really treasure my time with Leah and Dave both, and and we we always say that you know after you get off the board, then we can actually become friends in the real world, because um, because really you know we're not supposed to hang out more than two of us together at the same time without letting the newspapers know and. <clears throat> So, you know, so if we get together for, for a, a social gathering, we have to let the radio and then the papers know that we're doing it. So um, it's at a little different level of, of friendship. So I look, hopefully I can, we can take it that, that place to that direction. But that's really all I have. So next item on our uh, agenda would be the Manhattan High School Student Athletics and Activities Participation <coughs> Report. Uh, with Janelle Bowden and uh, Mike Marsh is out today. So. Um, and I know you guys got our board reports before, but Mr. Herman had asked for numbers, so I have been scrambling mm -hmm. for the last couple of days, and this is the best mm -hmm. I can get you. Well, you did add a lot of numbers last last year. The report on even like the athletics had no numbers, so thank you for that adding that in. This is good information. I don't think the report has changed historically from what I have been told. Um, so I know you guys have gotten this and read it, but after I did my numbers, there are some corrections that I want to give you guys under the current considerations if you want to make the changes on your report. Instead of 61 student activities, there are 60 student activities. Instead of 12 co-curricular, there are 13. Instead of 20 extracurricular clubs, there are 19. Instead of 24 visual performing arts, there are 26. And instead of five academic and support groups, there are two. Okay. And knowing that this is only my second year of putting all this together, I'm still finding different different ways of doing things and different numbers. And um, we, got, we did have several new sponsors last year and we're gonna have several next year as well. So we're hoping to streamline and come up with a system that is a little bit more fluid, a little bit more time efficient that um, connects with Infinite Campus. So we don't have to do all of this manually next year. So hopefully my numbers will all be tied in with Mr. Marsh's number in one nice neat spreadsheet for you guys next year. Do you have any questions off of the report that you were given in your packet? I do think one thing that was really interesting to point out was the one, two, three, four, the fifth bullet. Um, Manhattan High School is a pretty big, it's a big beast. We like to refer it across the street. And the fact that we have of our minority students, 61% of them are participating in something. And I think that should be noted that we are doing a really good job of incorporating not just our non-minority, but our minority students at 61 and 66%. So I was very pleased to see that number. I think one thing that we do need to continue having conversations on is the low, uh, the free and reduced lunch status at 50% of our students. I think that's a conversation we need to continue having starting at elementary, working our way up to middle school, because if you don't participate when you're younger, you're not going to start participating in high school. So. That's a conversation we need to continue having. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much for those numbers. I You're think welcome. That, that, it helps a lot, I think. But... Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> <clears throat> Next, we have uh, three written reports, but I, the first one, I believe there's some people here from the nursing um, group that would like to come up and make a couple comments. or a lot of comments, however you want to do it. <laughs> My name is Liz 
Um, my name is Mindy Sturm. I'm one of the nurses. I'm at Theodore Roosevelt Elementary and Woodrow Wilson Elementary, and I'm kind of the head nurse this year. And my name is Robin Mall. I'm the nurse at Manhattan High School. And um, I know we give you guys a written report each year, but this year we just kind of wanted to take a few minutes to talk to you. Um, the example, the reason why is like when you look at a person who's sick, we look at their lab values, but we also look at the person and we put that together to make a decision. And so you guys always get numbers from us, but sometimes those numbers don't reflect what we're really doing for your students in the district. And so we just kind of wanted to take a few moments just to kind of let you get a better picture as we're moving forward, especially with new construction and the needs that we're going to have with the nurses. We'd really like to start putting that in your mind. Um, and I'm not going to go through this because I know you'll throw spitballs at me is what I heard, Kurt. So <laughs> I'm not going to read every little single number, but just a couple things to point out. If you look at that report that you got, 91% of the students in Manhattan Ogden district are coming to see the nurse. 91% of our students. That's a lot. And a lot of those visits are not just, I need a band aid. That's the little kids a lot, or I need medication. We're starting to see health office visits that are requiring a lot more beyond a two minute visit where I would say that we are the first healthcare access point for students in the district. Yeah. Do you want to, uh, yeah. you kind of, especially at the high school level. Yeah. I would just say that, um, that nurses, we are the first access point to healthcare. Um, when we see students in our office and um, we assess each student um, for, you know, what they're in for and if they need further follow-up care. Um, sometimes kids come in and they have, you know, something that's been going on for a while or something that is uh, unusual. And um, so at that point, we assess the student need or concern. Uh, we formulate a plan of care for that student. Uh, we assist parents with um, uh, finding the appropriate medical care for their child. Um, and sometimes that can be a time consuming process because mm -hmm. um, if they do or don't have insurance and, um, you know, if they don't have an established provider. So those kinds of um, things that we do for students um, take up a lot of time, um, but they're well worth it. And, you know, we will obviously continue to do that for um, students. We also assist students with um, obtaining dental and eye care, um, which if the student has a family who is not able to afford those things, um, that is something that we um, work diligently to um, take care of those students um, needs because if you have somebody who can't see in the classroom that obviously impacts their educational um, experience and if you have a child who is constantly in pain from a tooth or whatever that is decaying um, that obviously distracts from their educational um, experience also. Um, and then the other thing, one of the other things that we do is um, we are constantly um, updating and tracking immunization status of our students. And as you know, that there are areas of the country where the populations are under immunized. And so they have, are having outbreaks of diseases that have been um, previously uh, very well controlled and with populations being so transient, that's one of the very important things that we do. Um, yeah, yeah, they've added some new immunization, so we're having yes. to backtrack with every student in the yeah. district to make sure we're all compliant. Yeah. 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 Um, just, I, you'll see in your report, but you know, um, one thing that we would like to see is you guys start to evaluate, you know, know new positions the new schools and things is we'd really like to have four new nurse positions and what that would look like for us is right now our nurses are kind of divided there are some nurses that are just at one school a lot of your big elementaries have one school if you average out the nurses for example I have two small schools so I actually oversee 750 students between my two small schools the, the Academy of Pediatrics would recommend that one nurse be for probably about 250 healthy students. So, you know, there's a big gap there. Um, and so some of our nurses are split like me between two schools. Some are at one school. Robin at the high school has 1,400 students under her care. 
So there's a big gap there. So we'd like to start seeing more nurses added to our staff. One of the positions we'd like to see is um, with the middle schools. We have one middle school nurse who is amazing, but she serves both middle schools. And with moving the sixth graders up there, her load, she is already stretched very thin. We do all work together and collaborate to help each other out. But we could really use a new nurse at the middle school as we start to move the sixth graders up. That would be one of our requests. Obviously, the high school needs another nurse. The high school could use another nurse right now, <laughs> not just when we move ninth graders up. Um, the needs of the high school are very great. And, you know, most of us, Robin has a health aide that works for her, but we like to use the illustration of if you were in the hospital and you had the choice between us taking care of you or a health aide that we trained for two hours one day that kind of knows some things to come in and take for you. Who would you want to take care of you? And that's kind of the analogy. We really would love to those positions to be RNs that are filling that. Um, the fourth position would be um, at the new school, of course, rather than taking a nurse and splitting that, her covering two schools. And then finally, Marla is the only elementary, um, bigger elementary school that does not have a full-time nurse. That nurse covers Marla and one of our smaller schools. So we'd like to see that balanced out a little bit. Um, any other things yeah. to add? Or do you guys have any questions for us based on this report? Daryl, uh, you're talking about the kids that did not have insurance. Is mm -hmm. there any way to get them? I think it's called the CHIP program. Yeah, yeah, it's it's can care through can care. And we as nurses spend a lot of time doing yeah. that. Probably this year, I probably have helped probably 15 to 20 families get can care. Yeah. And does it work? I mean, can care is a nightmare. <laughs> it is a nightmare. It is a nightmare. So mm -hmm. yep. has it been able to help the kids yep. at all? Yes, it does help. It's a huge long process. That's that's one of the things I think maybe people in the community don't see what we do behind the scenes. For me to help one family with can care took me two or three months to help them get the process. Sometimes they don't have transportation to go help, you know. But yeah, we we do help with getting can care and dental insurance. Um, yeah. It's there's a lot that goes on behind that that yeah. we help families get. And I guess in the next part of it, you know, the kid comes in with maybe a bad cut or a break or whatever. Do you just immediately take them somewhere or do you have a physician on call or mm -mm. anything? No, it is our job is to assess the child first to decide what happens with their care from there. That's why it's so important to have an RN that's yeah. trained to know that. So if Robin comes in, I'm going to look at her arm. I'm going to decide, do I think it's broken? Do I not think it's broken? What needs to happen? And then we follow the protocol from there, calling parents. Usually, if it's a real big emergency, we call the ambulance. Like I've done at the high school. And we've had to do that before at some year. of the elementary schools. We've had to call the ambulance. But most of the time, we'll call the parent, and then they can take them for a referral. And also, um, not only do we evaluate the student at that time, but also provide follow-up <laughs> care. Um, a lot of times with older students, um, I might not send them to the doctor right away, you know, have them come back and let's see how this is um, progressing. And if it doesn't, if whatever the concern is doesn't progress, then they might need to be referred on. But there are a lot of things that we can do um, symptomatically mm -hmm. to help that student without sending the student to a doctor's appointment if they can not have to go to the doctor. Does that make sense? So, yeah, preventive and, and supportive care is what I guess what I would say. Katrina. Can you walk us through what that would look like uh, in a can care process? <laughs> on, <laughs> on what you're doing as a school nurse mm -hmm. to inform families, mm -hmm. to help people fill out paperwork, are mm -hmm. these ESL families? Mm -hmm. So tell mm -hmm. us, describe an experience that you went through. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I, I want to start with just um, through Infinite Campus, um, we can run report and if the, if the parents have filled out the information properly on Infinite Campus, it identifies um, those students who do have insurance <clears throat> and those students who don't. Mm -hmm. Now, the key is you know, are the parents being accurate reporting or truthful? Mm -hmm. um, so 
I know for me, and I think I can speak for the other nurses, mm -hmm. that we um, make a list of those students and we have pamphlets that we provide to them um, in English and in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, mine have a note on them that if they have any questions or uh, need assistance in, you know, following through on getting that, that they have all my contact information that they, that they can contact me. I've had several instances. Sometimes the parents will bring in the paperwork and I will walk them through. I will help them fill out everything because it can be kind of complicated. It is very complicated. Especially the families that are lower income that maybe don't have the education. Sometimes the medical language is very confusing on applications. So I, I've actually walked a family through it, helped them mail it, follow up with them. Um, we do have a good connection with the um, health department and with also Conza Prairie Clinic, which has helped me a lot this year, especially with families that don't speak English. Um, they have helped connect. They actually, Conza has a, an expert that you can make an appointment, help your student and family make an appointment with. And I've helped provide transportation or figured out transportation for them to get there. And they will walk them through the process. And then I follow up as needed. Yeah, a lot so of it times. kind of varies. Um, some families can't read. The parents can't read. I had a family this year where the mom could read nothing. And so everything was confusing to her. Mm -hmm. And so every bit of the process took a very long time. Yeah. So, and also just arranging transportation. That's um, a very yeah, big one. If you do one. have can care, there is a transportation number you can call, but if you don't have can care, we have to try to help figure out how to get them there. Yeah. So we have bus passes that the health department has given us to get the ATA bus and a lot of families, in itself. <laughs> a lot of families, it's just the encouragement to follow through. That takes so much time. Like, did you do that? How can I help you? Did you do that? How can I help you? And that's taken a lot of my time behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And just, it's a different way of caring. It's not the illness, it's preventative type medicine. And we do, I think we're doing a lot more of that than we used to. As well as just seeing more, mm -hmm. um, uh, serious conditions at school a lot more yeah but I will say just for you guys to know that you guys have hired great nurses <laughs> the people that I work with are amazing and in fact I had a parent the other day said came and told me I was so scared to send my kid to school because of their health conditions but I love this school district because I felt so safe with my kids so know that the nurses you hired are are the people we work with are amazing and doing a really good job. So good job, nurses, if you're watching. So, um, okay. Carla, are we done, Judy? I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't like you, <laughs> Katrina. I, I don't know Kurt, why. Kurt really struggles to keep Judy. You can throw a spitball at him. It's <laughs> no, it's fine. Just a follow-on question about the the can care. Mm -hmm. Have we, as a district, um, to your knowledge, or maybe? Um, Eric or Dr. Wade might know the answer to this. During central enrollment, have we ever partnered with um, uh, CONSA or who's the other organization? Oh, the health department. Health department. To have a station um, to get people I registered. I don't know. Then. In the few years mm. I've been here, we haven't. I Not know. during central enrollment. Yeah. Central enrollment's been strictly district because okay. once we open up, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say we used to have they used to have vaccine clinics, but that's that can get a little confusing with paperwork and the parent has to fill. Um, yeah, that I think there were some things and they stopped doing that for various reasons. That was before I was here. So. Yeah. And Eric, was there? You said central enrollment is strictly. Kind of went to a straight district thing, so we. Everybody wants a table at central enrollment or they used to want a table at central enrollment to be able to come in and connect with the families and it just got to be too much for everything by the time mm -hmm. every agency yeah. wanted a place. Mm -hmm. So do we table. have any other avenues that we can open up every other agency to to families? I think there's opportunities at the building levels at some of their activities. And one of the things have. the nurses have talked about that we're working on is having the health department come to the schools um, to give immunizations that are missing. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we're trying to figure out the process because we haven't had a chance to really talk to Dr. Wade yet, but one of the things, here you go, Dr. Wade, I'm throwing this your way. <laughs> uh, one of the things is um, to really have our district be a place where if you're not 
immunized, you know, there is an exclusion to some degree until you get that done, yeah. but yet we would provide a way to get that done at the school level so that the parents aren't missing work and running around. So that's one of the things yeah. that we're working towards. That's one of our goals this year is to try to figure out how to bring some of that <clears throat> into the school yeah. to help families. And maybe that would be a point of access of, mm -hmm. Hey, do you have insurance? Well, here, you know, right. Carla, I'm going to change gears on you. <laughs> um, in the conditions that you guys were treating. So in that chart, mm -hmm. um, and I'm assuming that this might just be the first year that you guys were tracking it. Cause mm -hmm. I'm sure it was not the first year that kids were having headaches and migraines. Right. I found that interesting. Um, and I'm also assuming and correct me, um, that you're not talking about Oh, my head kind of hurts that, that what you're talking about is what you guys are truly assessing in yeah, that the regards. Health, the health conditions you're going to see are what parents would register their child is having. So yeah, that, that's not reported. a tip. It's parent reported. Mm -hmm. And I think okay. the reason we added headaches and migraines on there is that is becoming so prevalent in yeah. the schools. And, and, and it's more than like what you're saying, like, Mrs. Stern, my head hurts. Cause I just spun on the wheel outside. You know, it's, it's more than that. Like, I, I probably see a migraine a day at school in my schools. I mean, and, and you're so, at ele um, elementary. In elementary, level. I bet I see at least a kid a day that has some kind of migraine. Mm -hmm. So I think that was just one that the nurses felt like was becoming more prevalent. It was just we just kind of wanted to track. Like, is that just, you know, and you know, it could be attributed to all kinds of things. Who knows? But but these are all parent reported. So these aren't things that we actually have assessed, like as a nurse, if that makes sense. Dave. Well, I was just digging at some of the numbers too, and Carla, you know, brought them out. It's amazing how some of the numbers are just so consistent year after year, and then some others, you know, have really grown. One of those being just the total number of visits by students. Oh, has, we had a lot this year. Has really grown. Yeah. Well, that's been a steady. That's yeah. It's been on a pretty steady arc. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, that's just one of those factors to consider when we're looking at the budget for next year. It's also just really dismaying to see how many kids with cancer you're dealing with this year. Mm -hmm. And even just the total sad. medications in the school, there's a thousand more administered. And these aren't, and not all these are just like little Tylenol, like some, and cough drops, some of those are, but really the medications we're giving, in fact, one of the RNs at the, one of the elementaries has an injection that can only be given by a registered nurse. It can't be given by the health aid. It can't be given by, it can be by the parent if they're there, only by a registered nurse. And so some of these medications we're seeing are even starting to have restrictions. Oh, yeah, they're, they're absolutely, like if you could look at my medicine cabinet at the high school, it's serious stuff that I have in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know. And we're seeing a lot more kids that are on controlled substances now. Lots. We had to buy safes to really lock those up tight because so many more kids now are on controlled substances for ADHD or some of them do have cancer medication or things that they need to be given while they're at school. So we're seeing an increase in that kind of stuff too, which as nurses, a health aid operates under my license. And so yeah, my license is covering them. And so in some degree, some ways, there is some sense of like, that makes me a little nervous. Yeah. That, you know, I'm leaving my building, even though it's my little Woodrow kids or my TR kids, there's still 350 some of them under the care of a person that we've trained, but yet my license is still covering her. So just sometimes there's some yeah. nervousness about that with the medical needs that we're seeing. Okay. Anyone else? Daryl? Uh, I know several times a year we have that uh, Manhattan group downtown that does the food distribution plus sees doctors and dentists and everything else. Do they help with the uh, enrollment program as well at that location? I forgot. It's Manhattan Cares or Manhattan. Yeah, like they have the day where they do that. Everybody counts. counts. Everybody, counts. Everybody counts. Thank you. I keep forgetting. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I would guess that they would if there were doctors down there. They might assist so. with the physicals and stuff, but I'm not sure about you know, getting, getting the immunizations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. They will be providing a trailer um, in the fit closet for immunizations in August and are working on communicating uh, updates. So that's something Tracy Henry, who is our coordinator at the fit closet, is playing up. So, yeah. 
Which is great with the change because now high schoolers have to have a second dose of something. Yeah, meningitis is um, a new vaccination that all upcoming 11th grade students are going to be required to have. And a note went uh, regarding that went out in every upcoming 11th graders grade card. Mm -hmm. So if parents, if you're listening, please check your child's grade card because there's a note from me <laughs> in the nurses from the from the nurse. And every student now will have to have two hepatitis A shots that was not required before. So we're having to backtrack all or all the grades. So a lot of work to do. Sorry. Just to restate what Lacey was sharing um, into the microphone as well, that the there will be a trailer at the Fit Closet sometime in August that's being coordinated that will be available to provide immunizations. Okay. And those dates will be um, set and then announced, and they're still just in the coordination process right now. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for your attention. Thank you. Good report. She's still alive. You guys are nice. <laughs> okay, so we have two more written reports, uh, professional learning and collaboration annual report and the KISA accreditation report. Does anyone have any questions or comments on that? Okay. All right, on to new business. First thing we have there is uh, the school mental health initiative. And Dr. Wade, your name is on that one. Okay. Well, something that's been a point of conversation for the board, administration, administration, community members is, and, and, and a lot with staff. And it's something that is in that KISA visitation report is the conversations about mental health, social, emotional needs. What can we do? to better meet the needs of our, our students and, and our staff and our families. And uh, what we've got now coming before the board is the school mental health initiative that uh, is, is a great opportunity for our district and our community to partner together. Pawnee Mental Health, the school district, representatives from TASN to have a more comprehensive approach to uh, meeting the social emotional needs of our, our communities and our families. So we're fortunate to have three professionals from the School Mental Health Initiative, which is part of TASN, which is part of the Kansas Department of Education. So if you'd come up and join us, and I believe we have uh, Pawnee represented in the audience too as well. So thank you for being here. She did, she's just gonna sit back there and watch. <laughs> I, I think I think you I believe we said that she doesn't have to speak I think that was our agreement yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and Cherie if you'd introduce the team and get us going Absolutely. thank you <laughs> oh, the Thank you. Not bad, there's hardly anybody left. While uh, he's getting this set up and going, uh, this is just uh, just a few yep, visuals for us, but yes. Um, oh, goodness. Okay, all right. I, this makes sense, thank you. Um, so my name is Cherie Blanchett, and I am a project coordinator for the School Mental Health Initiative, as Dr. Wade explained, um, is uh, part of TASSEN. Um, and TASSEN provides technical assistance on behalf of the State Department of Education and consists of several projects within it, including our Kansas multi-tier system and alignment team that provides training and support to schools specifically around that Kansas MTSS and alignment framework, as well as our family engagement partners, Families Together, Karen, uh, Kansas Parent Information Resource Center, um, and the School Mental Health Initiative is a, is a newer uh, initiative um, recently funded through the Special Education Personnel, or yeah, uh, State Personnel Professional Development Grant, which is a special education funded grant. And I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that, uh, go through and give you just some quick context. Um, and uh, 
just kind of the uh, objectives of the coaching system um, and then what a partnership with our team would look like. I have with me today two of our uh, colleagues within our initiative, and that's uh, Amy Wells and Kristen Sheldon. Um, our team consists of, we, uh, it's a multidisciplinary team. We have professionals with backgrounds in social work, uh, clinically licensed school social workers, uh, administration, building level administration, special education teachers, um, and um, another expertise. And the reason for that is because, as, as you guys know, uh, school mental health involves uh, everybody. It's more than just a person. Um, I was actually really encouraged uh, sitting here listening to your, your nurses. And as I, of course, for me, I, I get excited, I say get excited. You see the correlation and the increase um, in, um, in nurse visits because a lot of times too, kids that are experiencing anxiety or what have you, um, we know that there's a physical correlation. So if you want, to, is there a clicker for, yeah. So here's, uh, I've already kind of, here's what we're gonna briefly go over and then, um, You'll be my clicker? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so it sounds like you guys are already pr pretty familiar with that adverse childhood experiences study. Okay, so I don't have to give a lot of context there, um, which is great, by the way. Uh, it's pretty awesome when I ask that question and everybody starts nodding their heads, like, yeah, you can keep going. Um, we do know uh, that, that um, you know, the correlation with adverse childhood experiences and the number of them, those children are more likely to have language difficulties, two and a half times more likely to fail a grade, are more often suspended or expelled, uh, have lower standardized achievement test scores, and are designated to special education more frequently. Uh, that ACES study has been replicated in numer numerous times. Kansas, uh, this, in Kansas, the, the statistics are consistent uh, with the numbers in other states as well. We know, so we know that this impacts student learning. I think we also know that it has an impact on our staff. Uh, we see staff that are uh, struggling with their, with their own, you know, well-being. Um, for one, if you look at the number of adverse childhood experiences, we know that that's not just our students. In fact, the study is conducted uh, initially with adults. We know that our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our secretaries, our bus drivers, I mean, this is in, it's in our community. But then when you have, you know, teachers who are supporting a large number of students with challenging experiences, that can also become, you know, pretty, pretty toxic. So we know that this impacts our teachers as well, it can result in compassion fatigue, burnout, secondary trauma, et cetera. The Kansas State Department of Education has been paying really close attention to this uh, uh, and um, has, we, we've really, there's just been a lot of support to address uh, the needs of the child, you know, more holistically and taking into consideration uh, the ACES study. This school mental health framework is one of two handouts that's in your folder. This, uh, this, this handout is a way um, that uh, the Kansas State Department of Education has just tried to kind of show comprehensively and a comprehensive approach for addressing um, all of the needs that we have, including the, the you know, social emotional learning, uh, mental health and wellness education. But what's unique, so you guys already have a lot of these efforts going on in, in your district. Um, and then the other thing you guys have going on here and is a key component that needs to be emphasized is that need for looking at community data and engaging with our community partners to address this need, the idea that schools can't go it alone. Uh, we are really good at looking at our data and making decisions as a district at, at the building level, et cetera, but we don't always look at our community data in conjunction with that. I loved hearing uh, that you guys were working with um, you know, the Boys and Girls Club and incorporating reading. So anyways, looking at those partnerships in that way. Um, you're also already familiar with that multi-tier system of support framework. Um, we are really, uh, the expectation for us, and as you could, you know, noted in that, that previous slide, is that this is not an add-on, it is an add-in, it is part of that social, emotional, and behavior uh, learning component. Um, you know, it's, it's, 
it wasn't that long ago that, you know, schools might address academics, you know, or behavior. And it, it took a while before we saw you can't separate the two, right? Well, now we have, you know, there's behavior and they're social emotional, but we know that mental health is a part of that well. So it's really just starting to, um, it's just that continuous move forward to align efforts and direction um, and make sure that what we are doing um, has the biggest bang for, you know, its buck, so to speak. So then uh, the State Personnel Professional Development Grant. There are four primary um, objectives of this grant which is to strengthen the capacity of cross-system teams. That's why we do have our community mental health. I should have been, you're who I should, well, you guys already saw her trying to hide. Um, but the, the idea is that we really truly partner with our community mental health center. We know that there's already strong relationships there. In fact, I can tell you when I reached out to uh, Pawnee for participation, they were, they were incredibly responsive um, and, and couldn't wait to, you know, get a response from you guys uh, to know uh, um, if we could move forward with just kind of um, enhancing that partnership. I think a lot of times you're familiar with the school has one plan, the district or, you know, the CMHC has another plan, whether that's, um, you know, a behavior support plan and a case management plan or what have you, but there's not always solid um, collaboration. The ultimate dream um, of, is, you know, we are kind of starting up there with some of those more tier three needs, but the dream is that we really pull those, that, you know, our partners into the tier two and tier one interventions. Um, obviously, within a tiered framework, utilizing that data, like I said, not just looking at our school and district data, but our community data as well. Um, uh, this past year has been our first year doing this, and we've already been able to identify that the CMHC has data that the schools really benefit from, from knowing, are able to plan more strategically, and vice versa, that the district has information that really helps them to meet the needs of, of their students and make informed decisions since they serve not only the district, but an entire several districts. So then uh, for us, the idea is that they're, you know, resulting from this grant and this work that we're doing is that there will be replicable resources and protocols uh, for other districts to utilize. And, and um, we'll explain where you guys come into play or, or why we hope to be able to partner with you guys here in just a second. Uh, a partnership with the Tassin School Mental Health Initiative essentially comes down to this, that we have process and then initial planning components. We really see our role as facilitators um, again, we are here to support that uh, cross-system collaboration, uh, help do that resource mapping and gap analysis, and try to help you guys streamline efforts in conjunction with our Kansas multi-tier system and alignment colleagues. Uh, provide coaching and collaboration, uh, or I'm sorry, provide coaching um, around uh, action planning that the that the uh, district community leadership team would be setting and helping to monitor for those, for those outcomes. So um, what does this look like when it's all said and done? Um, this is a, just an example of what kind of a trauma responsive school might look like. I've already seen uh, Dr. Ware, Dr. Wade has shared with us, you guys already have some great things going on in your buildings. Um, how do we strengthen those or make sure that they're, you know, effective or which ones, you know, uh, are working or could be aligned better? Some examples of trauma responsive practices in schools obviously do include that social, emotional and behavior learning component that you guys are already doing well. Um, looking at well-being and not just the well-being of students, but of staff as well and adult social, emotional learning um, we know that we are encouraging and promoting and providing our teachers with um, ways to support the social emotional learning of children, but we don't always support their own social emotional learning development. Um, all the way up, of course, to the wraparound and, and tier three stuff. So this is just an example of what that would look like. And then um, landing on um, the end, which is, you know, why, uh, why are we seeking out uh, a partnership with this district? Um, again, I mentioned last year was our first year. Uh, the Kansas State Department of Education is actually uh, one of 17 states 
that receives this funding. Um, and it's a very competitive grant. Uh, KSDE has actually been awarded this grant since 1999, and it has resulted in, um, in the sustainability of several effective practices, including co-teaching. Uh, it was helped to uh, provide training to districts in uh, the functional assessment process, um, what have you. Uh, with the um, with the priority on mental health and adverse childhood experiences, we do not want to see this project fail. So KSDE has been um, selective as we look at districts. Basically, as we start this workout, are looking for districts that have a strong uh, Kansas multi-tier system of support framework and alignment in place. Uh, you guys are clearly right up there. Um, and so we're hoping to be able to benefit from the work that you guys have done and the structures that you have in place as much as we're hoping to be able to be of benefit to you as well. I hope I made sense. Questions, comments, Dave? <clears throat> so how do kids get identified as having you know, had adverse childhood experiences or being traumatized in some way or another? So in the state of Kansas, over 50% of children have experienced one or more adverse childhood experiences, a little over 30%, two or more. Um, there is, like I said, that correlation in the number of adverse childhood experiences uh, with uh, poor outcomes. And, and again, can't help you know, after having listened to your nurses as well. I mean, ultimately, we know that it impacts us physically. Um, as far as the number of specific students, and here's where it's interesting, because that, that survey is done. I mean, it's, you're, you're surveying adults, not necessarily um, children. Some schools are experimenting with, with, assess, you know, with asking those questions to children. There's still kind of some, some discussion or debate on whether or not that should be done and what that looks like as we talk about needing to focus on resilience as much as we're talking about or recognizing the need. Um, so to give you an exact number there, I wouldn't be able to, to tell you this is, however, a conversation that that district community leadership team that partners those leaders that are working um, together uh, could explore talking about. But we know that adverse childhood exper you know, experiences it includes divorce a person in your family with mental illness, um, a family member that's incarcerated, uh, uh, things that, um, you know, aren't, don't necessarily mean poor outcomes, but that when uh, there's a large number of them grouped together result in more. So <laughs> did that help to answer your question? It does. Um, <clears throat> does poverty count as a, one of those? So there is recent research that is looking at uh, other factors that were not included in the initial study, and poverty has certainly become an indicator. Um, but of course, you know uh, how far the research is able to drill down and tease that apart. If you if you are in poverty, you're more likely to have uh, you know be surrounded um, with negative in in, an, in in a negative environment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Daryl? Well, I just think that with, on. it is on. <laughs> I forget all the time. Uh, I think with the loss of, of three students this year, it's obvious that we need help. Um, I doubt this is enough, but at least it's a starting point. Uh, mental health, I think, is a big issue within the United States altogether. Uh, there's not enough support for it, not enough strength for it. And we're losing psychiatrists and everything else all over the place because we don't support it. So our support system is not necessary. But because I think this is a starting point and something I think we desperately need help with, I would like to make the motion. Uh, I move to give final approval to the letter of support for USD 383 participation in the school mental health professional development and coaching system. Seconded by Leah. Anything from the audience? All those in favor? Motion passes 6 0. 
Thanks for coming. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Hopefully, I didn't go over my 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. Next item we have is uh, laptop purchases for the CTE program, which is career technical education. It's on page 115. Carla? I move to give final approval for laptops from Riverside Technology, Inc. of South Sioux City, South Dakota, in the amount of $14,700. Seconded by Leah again. She's pretty fast on that tonight. Anything <laughs> from the audience? All those in favor? Motion is unanimous. Uh, next item is the... Did we... we were, did we... Never mind. The uh, web-based project management? Yes, that's there. Is that the one we moved? No. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. I have a motion. Okay. Leah? I move to give final approval to the scope of services submitted by Drexel Technologies of Lenexa, Kansas for the web-based project management services for $58,395. Seconded by Daryl. Audience, all those in favor? 6-0. Did I skip? Oh, oh, that's right. It's in the in our uh, EBN. There's a uh, student desktop purchases also for CTE. It would be on page four of that document. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> read my... I have a motion. Uh, Leah, I move to give final approval for computer desktop equipment purchases from Cybertron Computers of Wichita, Kansas in the amount of $18,500. Second by Carla. I want anything from the audience, all those in favor, six zero. Okay. Now, did we do, yeah, we did the web-based management mm -hmm. already, and then 8.5, we moved to the written, right? So we are beyond that. Um, so 8.6. Is uh, for the uh, the Keith Knoll Maintenance Center and Strong Building Projects. Mr. President, we have Daryl. I move to give final approval to the proposal submitted by Gould Evans of Kansas City, Kansas, for design services for Keith Knoll Maintenance Center project in the amount of eighty-five thousand four hundred and fifty-seven dollars. Seconded by Dave. Audience, all those in favor, six zero. Okay. Next item, the middle school running track resurfacing project. Carla. I move to give final approval to the bid submitted by Schilling Construction of Manhattan, Kansas for construction services to resurface the running tracks at Anthony and Eisenhower Middle Schools in the amount of $145,150. Seconded by Dave. Audience. All those in favor? 6-0. Okay, I think the next thing we have is uh, the guidelines for professional therapy dogs. Dr. Wade is on that. Um, first, I want to mention that thank you to Katrina for bringing this to the, to our attention. <laughs> um, there was uh, some uh, a student at Amanda Arnold who was uh, affected by one of our therapy dogs, and uh, she recognized that we didn't have any type of uh, policy or guidelines in place for that, and so she did the, did the legwork and got some examples for us. So um, that's why we have this uh, this policy. I don't know if he wants to talk about it, or did you want to talk about it? Okay. Mr. President? Yes. I'd like to go ahead and uh, make a motion. Okay. I move to give initial approval to proposed changes uh, changes to policy INH, including guidelines for professional therapy dogs in USD 383 schools for policy INH. Seconded by Daryl. <laughs> Audience, all those in favor? Six zero. They're already giving me homework out there. <laughs> 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 uh, <yeah. laughs> all right, that is. Uh, now we're up to election of board officers. Um, I just, I was the one that asked for this, obviously, and um, I just, the reason, let me hold on here. What about the bond? Well, that's 9.1. Oh, okay. 
I lost track. Wait a minute. Mm-hmm. So, so we're, we're track. We did yeah, we did we the did school, track. school track. And then 9.1, it would be in old business. Okay. That's all right. No, we, so uh, the reason I brought, uh, I guess I wanted to talk about this because while, you know, it's a new law that had passed and, and uh, so now it's up to the local boards. And as I read through, I, I had some notes in here and I didn't save them. So <laughs> um, the, uh, but if I'm, from my understanding, if I read that correctly, I mean, and the only reason I want to talk about it is, well, several reasons, but it, if I read this correctly in the first meeting of January, actually the second Monday in January, and Leah, you can please jump in if, um, yeah, okay. Um, and so at that point we have to at least make a motion or table the reorganization of the board. Um, it's, it's still, it's still kind of expected to be done at that meeting, first meeting in January, but, uh, we, I think it's a, every year we have to, second, second, meeting. it's a second meeting. Yeah. So, but at, at that meeting, we either have to reelect the board officers or table it. And then, and then the motion would be, I think at that point, um, would say that, uh, you know, I, I nominate, you know, I don't nominate Daryl Eady for board, board president until a successor is, is, uh, elected. All right. Cause, cause if we say it's typically for one year, mm-hmm. wasn't that one of the KSB recommendations? Where was that? Why would we change it for one year? Like I said, I, I had notes and I lost the, I, they're gone. It's one of the recommendations because it gives you the option to do right. it at either location. Uh-huh. Yeah, so either we had, time. So, yeah, I mean, it's, we could say instead of, well, I guess we don't ever say it's just for one year. We just nominate and vote on it. So, mm-hmm. uh, do, do you, I mean, so did you understand, <laughs> do we need to specify whether it's until, a, you know, a successor is elected or do we? Mm-hmm. The way I understand it is the way our resolution was written that appointed the officers was for one year term. So as far as and this is from Diane and I's interpretation of what we did last July. So the, our understanding is we appointed a for one term. The law states that it has to be done in January. So probably we got a little gap between so you can appoint a president, but I wouldn't be able legally without bypassing this. Like you can't set for a year because you, it, it's kind of like monopoly where January's go and you cannot, do not pass go, do not collect $200. You can't pass January. Um, so you've got to deal with it in January, but you also need to deal with it July to January as well this year. And then every succeeding year, you can take it up in January and say, we will deal with this in July, or you can say, we'll deal with this now. But what you probably can't do under the law is say, oh, we're just going to deal with it every July and we're going to bypass that. You have to hit it every January you go through. It seems like we should add that to our operational calendar. We will. Does Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Yeah, and and then like I said, another reason I wanted to mention is because I mean it. it yeah, I'm I mean I'm okay with doing it in July, and I'm I'm gonna oppose to that. But it does I think it does some somewhat limit. Um, well, a great example with Pat Hudgens, she knew she was not rerunning for the board, and since she was, right. I mean, typically the vice president becomes a president, and she didn't. That didn't happen because she knew she was going off the board in six months, so she didn't even. And well, you know, so Dave and Leah Le- now, I mean, if. Anyway, that, that's the only reason I brought it up. Not that I want to get another six months out of a presidency, but <laughs> <laughs> which it would work out that way. But, but, you know, so anyway, that's why I wanted to mention it and that we should just, I guess, yeah, briefly and, talk about it. And, and the language recommended until a successor is appointed gives the board the option right. um, to allow that extension if needed. Um, and it doesn't lock you into the one year terms that we currently have. Right. That, yeah. That's what I was trying mm-hmm. to make the point of. So you guys okay with stick? Cause if, if, you know, you're okay with still doing it then July, then this year, and then we'll just add it to operational calendar that uh, every July or January to, to uh, make that uh, motion and vote on that. Dave? So you're saying that you still just want to do it as a, a 12 month, but 
and then take action on it in July and then June. Well, January, I think this statute says we have to. I, I would I would recommend. No. <laughs> statute I, says January yep. or at a date to be determined, determined by, by the, the board. board. Right. You have to make right. that determination at that second January meeting. Mm -hmm. So if you want to elect them in January, that's cool. But if you don't, at every year at that second meeting in January, you have to say board elections will be on, you know, X date. Right. Uh, right. I think that's what I said. Okay. okay. Maybe that's not the way I heard it. Sorry. But I would recommend for July because you're going into you don't have authority. There's there's no action on authority, but and you know you have to deal with that in January. So you can't get ahead of yourself in January. So what I would probably recommend and like I said, you guys can do however, however you need to, but I would recommend somebody um you guys determining a president, vice president from July until that until meeting January. in January, mm -hmm. and then you can. Because we have the home rule authority to do that. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. With no, no, you <laughs> no, go for it. You, yes, ma'am. <laughs> you you do Abs absolutely. Daryl. Okay, so I'm confused enough. So, are we trying to say that we need to elect somebody at this point in time, from July <coughs> through the, the second meeting of January, and then in January we will actually start a process in which we will start electing offices in January for each year. No. Is that what we're saying? Or are we saying that we're going to just stay with our July election process? Well, we're saying, <laughs> well, we're saying that, <clears throat> but I think every year we have to, we have to stay every year. We January. have to state that we're going to appoint the July July. officers in, in July, or but we have them at any other date that you want. Right. Right, but we but we have to once a year make that statement or that vote, I guess. Right. Right. So this this July is a unique time. Yes. Right. Because of the way the law is written, so yeah. the you know this year we have this funky thing, but then in January we either we could say <clears throat> we want this board leadership team to continue, you know, until. July one, or right. or we could say new elections, new elections, and they'll take place next week, or you know, at the first meeting in February, or you know, that then becomes the new board's decision as to how quickly they want to elect officers. Okay, everybody got it. Dave, Dave, I don't think I do. I so I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it is, got, yeah. It's so supposed it's to simplify confusing. it, right? Thanks, legislation. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 Never so, uh, <laughs> this is ours. Our yeah. Carla did a great uh, job so, testifying. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that bus go over here? <laughs> anyway. So, uh, so, what I'm pondering is is it this board's job to decide? what the next board wants to do. I mean, I personally feel like the elections need to move to January, um, that second meeting in January. And I know that the new board members express some, some reticence about the very first meeting they're involved in having to select leadership, but you know, it's a tough job. There's, there's always gonna be tough things. And it, the only clean way to have leadership transition is to have it start and end at that second meeting in January, anyway, start in the second meeting of January and end the following first meeting in January. That otherwise, you're if, if the if the meet, if the elections are going to continue on into July, you're always going to have this problem of somebody who wants to be in a leadership position mm -hmm. not having a full term to be in leadership, right? Um, which is what you were hinting at. This is a weird one. We had a weird one. So, but I so I fully support us. Can say us. I'm going to be on the board. Um, the board moving to the second January meeting in January. There being new officers elected. But is that our? Is that this current board's job, or is that the next board's job? I would I would say the the first thing is what the current board's responsibility would be is July to January. What the next board's determination would be is second meeting in January. 
on the we next decide year. If we're going to do it every January or right. keep doing it in July. But every year we have to every do it every year you have to go back to that decision. So right. under yes. under the statute, you could do it in July one year, February one year, March one. Year. I I hope you don't. <laughs> That's just my thought. But under the law, you could because it does say uh, if a if a board does want to keep these actions in July, there will need to be an added step of voting on a schedule. These votes at a later time every year. Right. January again. Yeah. Right. Uh, who's got, who was first? Yes, Diane. It, it just kind of boils down to right now, you either have to decide on somebody being board officers for six months or somebody will extend to cover that extra six months. Mm -hmm. The first, right. Right. The first time we. <coughs> yes. And then, and then the you'll cycles. get into yeah. your, your rhythm after that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Katrina. So a couple of things as someone who will be on the board in January, <laughs> if I'm comfortable, if, if our, if this current board wants to make some determinations, that's fine. It's when we, came onto the board a year and a half ago, new members, we were still having to live with decisions that had been made previously. So I think that that's okay for us to make a decision. I would also like to recommend that we go ahead and establish the board leadership in July, like we need to, for six months, and go ahead and establish that we're gonna do another election, like Dave recommended at the beginning of January, um, the as statute says, and that's gonna be okay. So it's an odd time, but let's go ahead and set the next board up for success by making that determination now. So it's on the calendar and we can expect right. it. That, that's why, yeah, that's why I wanted to talk about it tonight. So, okay, good. Thank you. Dave? So this, is, this is, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask anyway. The, the organizational meeting for the board in the district though will still be the first meeting in July right. because we operate on a fiscal calendar for you know, right. that's, that's July 1 to June 30. We would still do our so board all that all that stuff would still happen that first meeting yes. in July. Yes. Um, I thought that was the answer but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, so what do we have to decide tonight? <laughs> well I just I guess we need to decide if we're going to make a change in J July or or not because the at our next our next board meeting with the last meeting of June we always typically anybody interested in being a board officer speak up now and then and then the first meeting in July then we go so do you need a motion uh, well it's not really an action it's not an action <laughs> item but yeah it's not a discussion item it's and more of a you, you can also hash over it and put this back on the agenda for the last June meeting too. And do we want to yeah. and just think about well, wanna, what other way you want? Do you yeah, want to be an officer? You want to table it, and I guess there's no action. But maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, next maybe we'll make it an action item. In the next because we have our board officer uh, interest as as our last meeting, and then we can we'll take up this discussion again. Maybe we have a little more time to think it through and study the. The, uh, the statute maybe is that cool <laughs> okay I thought I just thought I should we should bring it up now because no, you're you absolutely because so. obviously <laughs> okay yeah well yeah I am too but <clears throat> excuse me okay very good so you got it for next meeting then for us Diane um, now we are at we added uh, item 9.1 that's in the EBN um, starting on Let's see. Yeah, it looks like page page six. Dave. Mr. President, I move to give final approval to resolution number 1819-18, <clears throat> authoring the issuance, sale, and delivery of general obligation refunding bonds series 2019 with a principal amount of four million four hundred and five thousand dollars. He's saying about Carla. Anything from the audience? All those in favor? Motion is unanimous. Just for everybody saying that is from the 2008 bond election that were series 2019. And I'd like to point out one thing before you guys get too far down the road, if it's okay, Kurt. Sure, sure. But if you go to page 40, you get the refinancing summary. 
And you'll see just over the course of the last bond issue since 2008, the times we've refinanced and the savings to our taxpayers approaching $8 million. So the reason why we do this and we continue to come back to this and the reason you get 60 page packets from the lawyers with a lot of fun things is to save our taxpayers roughly $8 million. It's worth the effort and the time. Very good. And it's also worth uh, something uh, service of Piper Jaffrey to point out when it's the favorable times to do this as well. Very good. Okay. All right. Um, we have an executive session but before we do that. I just wanted to point out one last quick thing here. The um, <clears throat> just for NFYI for the board, if you look at our operational calendar, <clears throat> excuse me, boy, um, uh, the new new items that we added this year, uh, starting of June, is a superintendent evaluation process. So I've sent Dr. Wade the uh, the documents, and he'll have them back to us by June 28th. And then we do our evaluation in July, and then we finalize that in August. So just want to let you know we set it on a calendar, and it's and it's happening. So, and I'm sorry I got it to you two days later than the beginning of the month. So, <laughs> okay, I will take a. Motion for the executive session. Mr. President, I move we go into executive session for 10 minutes to discuss current negotiations pursuant to the exception for employer employee negotiations under the Kansas Open Meetings Act. They return to open session in this room at, uh, I need a break. So we're gonna say, we're gonna return to open session at 8.35. Is that gonna work? Five minute break and then 10 minutes? Yeah. Uh, joining us will be Dr. Wade and Eric Reed. Second by Daryl. All those in favor? Six zero. <clears throat>